I think this, uh, most of this conference is going to be physics. I'm going to tell you some real chemistry in aqueous solution at room temperature. And um, this chemistry is done inside protein nanopores, which for this purpose we regard as nanoreactors. So uh, most of you are familiar with this, but let me just recap the technology that we use. Um, so we use a protein pore called alpha hemolysin, and uh, that pore um, has a barrel um, that, uh, whoops, there we go, that goes through um, a lipid bilayer, and that barrel is about two nanometers, about 20 angstroms in diameter, and that's a very favorable dimension for looking at small molecules. So if we could monitor small molecules um, inside this barrel, we would be able to look at changes in their mass, changes in their shape, polarity, charge, and so on. And as you'll see um, briefly, we've been using that for looking at um, binding interactions, non-covalent interactions. Um, we can use th that technology for looking at polymers going through pores. And uh, today I'm going to focus on covalent chemistry. So um, the way we do this is to measure currents that flow through single copies of these pores. And these currents are, of course, carried by ions. They're ionic currents, so they'll be carried by potassium, sodium, chloride ions, etc., not by um, electrons. And um, typically, in a one molar salt solution, we might get a current of about um, 30 picoamps flowing through this pore, and we can measure changes in that current uh, under favorable conditions down to about 1%. So we can measure very subtle changes that go on inside the protein. So we started off many years ago developing a technique that we call stochastic sensing. And the idea was that we'd have a, a binding site, a fairly crude binding site, for an analyte inside the protein, and then we could watch individual binding events. So, for example, in this case, uh, we're just sensing metal ions, and uh, in this case, we're looking at zinc, and you can see that we can detect um, individual binding events um, at 50 nanomolar zinc um, in solution. And this technology was further developed to look at small organic molecules, to look at bits of DNA, peptides, uh, and, and so on. And um, eventually, this was uh, developed at, at Oxford Nanopore, and uh, Lakmal Jayasinghe is, is going to uh, tell you more about what's going on in the company tomorrow. But um, this technology was developed um, by the company to produce the uh, minine sequencer, which uses about 500 pores in parallel on a chip. And uh, looking at each base in the DNA as it passes through the pore, to get A, T, and C is about two milliseconds of base. And it can do ultra-long sequencing reads. And it's a portable, simple uh, device to operate. And um, the basis of this device uh, is that an enzyme is used to propel single-stranded DNA through the pore. This could be a polymerase, a helicase, a, a nuclease, any enzyme that will ratchet the DNA through the pore. And I mention this now because I'm going to come back to this idea later and ask the question whether this could be done chemically rather than enzymatically. So the second thing that we've um, been looking at over the years, and this has had much less publicity, is looking at covalent chemistry. So if you can look at non-covalent um, chemistry going on inside a pore, or look at polymers going through a pore, why shouldn't you be able to look at bond-making and bond-breaking events? And indeed, um, you can do that. And our first effort at that was about 15 years ago now, and in this uh, particular um, case, we have a, a nitrobenzyl-protected carbamic acid inside the pore, and we can shine light on it, 
And we can see the breakdown of this compound, the rearrangement of the nitrobenzyl group, the loss of that group, and then decarboxylation to um, form an amine um, on the protein. And as some of you, you know, these kind of molecules are used uh, for caging reagents in, in biochemistry, so that's the interest. But the point is that you can look at the individual events and look at the lifetime um, of those events. And um, to be able to do that, the um, molecules that you're looking at obviously have to be bound to the surface of the pore. If you just had a small molecule in the center of that barrel, you can do a very crude calculation that even in the absence of electrophoresis or electroosmosis, this molecule would diffuse out of the barrel in a few nanoseconds, so we wouldn't be able to see it using um, current recording. Um, the other thing is that in general, to do this chemistry, we need a protein that has one reactive site in it, although I'm going to come to um, a very interesting exception to that um, later on. Um, so for sort of basic chemical reactions, what we do is make a heteromeric pore. This pore has seven subunits, uh, but we can mix mutated and unmutated subunits and if we put an electrophoretic shift reagent on one of the subunits, um, we can separate out the, the forms of different combinations of subunits by electrophoresis, as you can see here. And in, we're usually interested in proteins that have six normal subunits and one subunit with a mutation in. So in general, um, that's been a thiol group, but we can use other methods to produce proteins with other uh, reactive group, groups in them. So typically, uh, we'd end up with a nanopore uh, that has a, thi a single thiol group on a cysteine residue projecting into the lumen um, of the pore. So if you could um, get a reaction at that thiol group or any other reactive group in the pore, you'd be able to um, find out something about the chemistry of that reaction. So in a simple a uh, bimolecular reaction, um, a, a molecule will become covalently linked inside the pore, and it will stay there for a certain length of time, and then that bond might be broken. I'm having problems with this thing as well. There we go, and it would go back to, um, to this state. And then, um, for a simple bimolecular reaction, the dwell time of the molecule in the pore will tell you this um, off-rate constant, and then to get the on-rate constant, you just look at the inter-event intervals. And of course, this is concentration dependent in this case. And that can give you the on-rate. And from that, you can get um, an affinity constant. So when we started thinking about co covalent chemistry, we were, at the same time, thinking about sensing. And there are lots of interesting molecules that react covalently in nature. Um, or um, some unnatural ones, like these crowd control agents and, and, and so on. And so we are interested um, in detecting these. And uh, we got really drawn into looking at uh, chemical warfare agents, in particular um, arsenic compounds, which were developed, um, this is a World War II poster, but they were developed um, earlier. And uh, lewisite was a particularly noxious um, agent. It doesn't actually smell like geraniums. It's an impurity that smells like ger geranium. So this is kind of odorless um, compound. And that uh, molecule, when you put it into water, reacts um, very quickly, becomes hydrolyzed, forms a so-called arsenous acid, which is an equilibrium with a dehydrated form. And these molecules are very toxic because they will react with proteins in your body that have two thiols at the active site, or they will react with cofactors like lipoic acid um, that have uh, two thiols um, pretty well um, irreversibly. Interestingly, in passing, um, Ehrlich's um, um, anti-syphilis reagent, Salvarsan, uh, which for many years was thought to have this structure by analogy with diazo compounds, actually is a much more complex mixture of these arsenic rings, and when they go into water, they are hydrolyzed and probably work by very much the same mechanism. So um, this reaction is essentially irreversible, 
you'll see um, that a bit later on. But when we uh, got into looking at these arsenic-3 compounds, we thought if we just had one file in the protein, uh, they would react and um, form this uh, compound. Because the other sulfur um, um, SH group is not there, it can't cyclize, and this would probably be a reversible um, reaction. And I can tell you in advance now that these um, um, compounds have uh, a lifetime of about one second um, in aqueous solution. So um, we made um, various arsenic compounds. Here's one here that um, has a sulfonate group on, so it's water-soluble. And when you put this compound in um, with a protein, um, you'll see various events. And each of these events represents a bond-making or a bond-breaking event. So here um, at the beginning, arsenic-sulfur bond is made, arsenic-sulfur bond is, is broken. But there are a lot more interesting things in this chemistry. So, for example, even this simple compound uh, can react with a protein to form, um, to form two enantiomers by virtue of the lone pair um, on the arsenic, and the protein itself is, of course, a chiral environment because it's made of um, L amino acids. So these two adducts are diastereomeric. And in fact, they allow slightly different, so they're physically different, and they allow slightly different amounts of current to flow through the pore. So later in this trace, you can see arsenic sulfur bond made, inversion at arsenic bond broken. So in other words, it goes here, here, here. And uh, there's one here, bond made, inversion, inversion back, bond broken. So it's gone here, 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 and here. And um, by monitoring these reactions over time, you can work out the rate constants for all of them. I won't go into the details of how we do that now, but you, you can see, for example, um, for this equilibrium, which uh, would have a... Um, um, a, the, the rate constant would be the same in both directions in solution. Uh, when it's in a chiral environment, these rate constants are different. And uh, there are many other interesting things you can get from this chemistry. So um, you can then elaborate this technology. Obviously, that's a very simple example. Um, but it turns out that the uh, hydroxyl group on the arsenic here uh, can be replaced by a second file presented from solution. And uh, just to illustrate the power of this technology, this is an example here where we have two um, different files in solution, a small one and a large one, penicillamine and uh, glutathione. And uh, these adducts can be seen in the trace here. And in both cases, again, there are two um, different uh, enantiomers. So, you can watch all of these um, transitions um, in a pretty complex mixture, and that would be pretty hard to do by NMR, for example, to pick out all these, all these uh, different um, adducts. So this would typically be the typical sort of trace that you can get. You can follow these reactions for many minutes, and again, you can work out the rate constants for every step um, in the reaction and uh, just to, to summarize what you would find out, there are 38 different possible trans, uh, uh, transitions in this reaction mixture. And it turns out that some reactions happen and some, that, some don't. And uh, the green ones here are ones that happen. The red ones are ones that, that don't happen. And that allows you to work out the stereochemistry of substitution at arsenic, which happens with, with inversion, just as it does in many reactions um, at uh, carbon. So reactions that occur with inversion are allowed. Um, reactions that uh, occur with retention are not allowed. So there's a, for chemists, there's a huge amount of interest in this technology. And, and by doing it at the single molecule level, there are, are many things you can, you can find out that you can't uh, when you do reactions in bulk solution. But um, while we were doing this, we had the idea that maybe we could elaborate this still further. And instead of having one reaction site in the, inside the protein, have several reaction sites in, 
inside the protein and make um, a little track. As you can see here, there are five cysteines on this beta strand here. I should have said that this is a, the, the barrel is a beta barrel. Sorry, go backwards. Um, and uh, if you take every other residue, it will project into the barrel. And this is a little track with um, five cysteine residues. And we wanted to ask the question whether this arsenic molecule could walk along this track. So it should react with a file, then a neighboring file should um, make it undergo a ring closure. If you could encourage that ring to open again, it might be able to walk up and down um, this track. So there's been a huge amount of interest in molecular walkers in the chemistry literature. And these are the, the kind of desirable features that people have been trying to, um, um, to get from their systems. So first of all, it should be simple. A lot of molecular walkers that you see in the chemistry literature are um, quite complex. We'd like these walkers to be processive, um, to be autonomous. You don't really want to add a chemical reagent after each step. We'd like them to be directional, just to move in one direction along a path, to be able to initiate it um, at anywhere on the path that you like, to get it dissociated any, from anywhere you like, to be able to carry things, and maybe to be able to control the direction from the outside world. And I, I'm going to show you that ultimately we've been able to achieve that. Um, the arsenic walkers were a kind of step um, in that direction. So um, the arsenic walker works by having, having the reagent I showed you. This will react with the thiol in solution. So we've put on two little thiol legs. And if we have our five residue track, it will react actually randomly along this, pretty well randomly along this track. But let's assume it reacts at one end. Um, it's stuck at this end. Then it can undergo a ring closure to form this uh, ring with two sulfur atoms in. And you'll remember that I told you that that's a pretty stable molecule and, and that it would just stay put were it not for the fact um, that we had, have a small amount of thiol free thiol in solution that can break the arsenic sulfur bonds. And, and it could either uh, break the bottom bond or the top one. If it broke this bottom one, the walker would now have moved one residue down the track. And then this can continue. And if it weren't a random walk, it would, the molecule would move from one end of the track to the other. Now, uh, the question is, how do we know where it is? And I told you we can ve measure very small changes in the current. And it turns out that the uh, extent of current block varies very slightly depending where it is um, on the track. And these are the cyclic, the four cyclic forms using double cysteine mutants. And you can see at the top of the track and at the bottom of the track, the, the current levels are quite different. It's quite hard to distinguish um, the position in the center of the track. But nonetheless, on a good day, um, you can uh, get this molecule to attach at the top of the track, and it, it'll walk down the track. It goes back up again a little bit here, and then finally detaches um, at the end of the track. Most of the time, it, it won't start where you want it to. So this is um, a fairly random process. Nonetheless, um, in terms of molecular walkers at the time, a few years back, uh, this was the one of the simplest walkers that takes very small steps, just six, six angstroms, uh, 0.6 of a nanometer, and each step takes about one second. And of course, you could monitor this in real time um, by current recording. So in terms of our scorecard, yes, this is pretty simple. Um, it's very weakly processive. After about six steps, it tends to fall off. Um, it is, even though we have some thiol in solution, it, it's, it's there all the time, so this is fairly autonomous. Um, the directionality is pretty weak. Um, you can't initiate it where you want to or get it to come off where you want to. It could carry a cargo on the aromatic ring, although we didn't demonstrate that. And we certainly can't control the direction um, of this molecule. I realize there's, there's no 
clock in here. So I have no idea. Ten minutes. I've used up 20 minutes. All right. um, okay. So, um, more recently, Yujia uh, King in the lab has developed uh, what we call a voltage co controlled processive molecular hopper. And we call it a hopper because it's not really walking, it's kind of jumping from one uh, position to another. So, let me show you how that uh, works. So, the idea is that we have the same track. It's a series of cysteine residues, and we attach a piece of DNA to that track via a disulfide bond, and I'll show you how we do that in a moment. Then the neighboring thiol can come along and do a so-called thiol disulfide interchange. We'll form a disulfide bond at that position, and this one becomes broken, and now you've moved one step down the track, and that can happen again and again and again. Um, so the idea, if you can see the bottom of the slide, I hope you can, is that you attach at a certain position, uh, this molecule will move down the track, and this is voltage dependent, we will, this DNA is negatively charged, we'll be applying a positive voltage here, and this will move one step at a time down the track. And amazingly enough, when you get to the bottom, you can flip the potential, the DNA will turn around inside the nanoreactor, and then um, under a negative potential, it will now uh, move up the track, and you can flip it, and it will move um, down in the other direction again. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. But first of all, let's just look at the chemistry. So this thiol disulfide interchange involves uh, a strictly linear transition state. The three sulfur atoms have to be collinear for this reaction to work. And this is what is happening when it's moving um, in this direction. And if this sulfur atom were to react with this one, you would form a disulfide bond, and this would come off the track. But it reacts with this first one, and then this bond is broken, and then it moves one step down the track. But this reaction, um, this is a regio-specific reaction. It only occurs on this sulfur, not on this one. Um, the walker can go backwards, so that if this chain gets kinked, which it will do occasionally, you can get a backward reaction because you can form a, a, a collinear transition state. Um, what, what it can't do is hop over a sulfur atom. The distance is just too long um, for it to do that. So um, how do we do this? Well, I won't go into the detail, but basically you make this rather complex molecule. So this is a molecule that has... A biotin at one end, so we can put a tight binding streptavidin, um, like tractavidin at one end. It has a variable length um, peptide, and then there's a linker region where there's a disulfide, where, and this is attached to a 40 piece of um, DNA. And um, these molecules um, um, react site selectivity with thiols in the protein. So this particular one, if you put it in um, with um, the walker that has thiols at 113, 115, 117, 119, 121, reacts only at position 115. It's extremely site-selective. And, and uh, you can see that happening here. So the idea of empty pore, this is electrophoresed into the pore. It will react specifically at this position. So here's the empty pore. Is the molecule's gone in, it's sitting there covalent reaction occurs, and because in this case we only have one thiol, it just basically sits there forever. Um, so if we do this with our track, we can again monitor this electrically. In this case, it first goes on 115, then migrates all the way to 121. Once it's at 121, you will see some reversible uh, reactions, and they're quite informative with, uh, with position 119. Then we flip the potential, and it, it hops in the other direction, flip the potential, hops again, flip it, hops again. And you can just do this over and over again. And we can make um, a six-foothold track, which is the best we can do, uh, with the hemolysin pore. And again, you see um, the same phenomenon. You, positive potentials, it moves this way. Negative potentials, it moves um, in the opposite direction. 
Um, I'm going to, I did have a couple of videos, but they won't work in this mode, so I'm going to skip them. And um, also show you that we can get this hopper to come off the track at a pre-selected site. And the trick there is to put um, a file on the adjacent um, beta strand. And the distance, the distance is slightly different between the strands, um, between two cysteines uh, across the strands than they are within the strand. And this actually favors disulfide bond formation. So once you um, get to this point, um, a disulfide bond will be formed and the walker will be ejected from the track. So you, you can get it to come off at any position um, that you want to. And you can see this happening here. I can get this thing to work. Here we go. Come on, there we go. So it goes in and it walks down to that position and then the bond is broken and the, water, uh, and the, the hopping molecule is ejected. And now the next time a hopping molecule comes in, it can only get as far as this position. So it gets to 117 and gets stuck because now you have a disulfide um, bond here. So if we had to summarize our scorecard now, um, this is, again, it's a simple molecule. This is a processive uh, chemical reaction. It just goes on forever. It never comes off the track unless you have um, a self-hydral on the adjacent um, beta strand. It's fully autonomous. You don't add any other chemicals to get this to work. Um, it's directional. Uh, you can initiate it where you want to by controlling the length of that peptide um, linker in your reagent, you can dissociate it where you want to, it can carry a cargo like DNA, and you can reverse the direction using an applied um, voltage. So um, how does this work? Well, obviously, voltage sets the overall direction by flipping the DNA inside the pore. Um, you are seeing downhill motion in the electric field that we'll come to just in a second. Uh, but I think there's also an entropic contribution as the polymer comes out of the pore or moves into this cavity, um, it can become more disordered. So there's an entropic contribution to this movement as well. But there's a lot of um, sort of potential for sort of computational studies to really understand how this uh, movement occurs. Um, but just in terms of the electric field, we can measure forward and backward reactions at different positions, particularly when we get to the end of the track. And um, actually, the um, difference between the forward and backward reactions is not that high. Of course, when you have a track, this is compounded. So if you have uh, five footholes, uh, six footholes, it will be um, the binding constant to the power five. But um, it turns out you can calculate that you get about five kilojoules by moving one step in this field. And if we actually determine the forward and backward rate constants that gives us the equilibrium constant, that's sort of roughly in the same order. These are obviously, uh, these, are, these are very rough um, calculations. So we reckon that the pulling force on this DNA is about eight and a half um, piconewtons. But there's a lot more that could be done to understand this chemistry. Now, I was promised you I'd come back to DNA sequencing. So the question is whether um, this kind of chemistry might be used to control DNA for sequencing. And the advantage of using enzyme, uh, many advantages, one is you handle double-stranded DNA. Single-stranded DNA is a nightmare to handle. DNA movement is slowed down, which is a requirement. So ratcheting motion, it's moving one base at a time. And um, the step length um, is, of course, one base. I should tell you that the distance between the disulfides, in the, uh, between the cysteines and the protein, is very similar um, to the distance between the, the nuclear bases and a stretched piece of single-stranded DNA. And also, um, using this uh, technique, the DNA is stretched. It doesn't coil up in the pore. So, um, might it be possible to do that with um, this chemical technique? Well, first of all, we, we could demonstrate that you can see differences between different pieces of DNA. So uh, that tells us this might be used doing. 
you, uh, worth doing. And we sort of took an easy way out here. We put a couple of A-basic residues in, so these differ um, very largely from each other, and um, just move them up and down the track and see if we could see uh, differences between the two. And um, I won't go into the details now, but if you remember earlier, like at a positive potential, um, these steps all moved upwards, but you can see even clearly by eye that when the um, abasic residues emerge from the pore, um, you get a, a current step in the opposite direction. And uh, this is something that's repeatable. And um, I need to finish up now, but I, um, we can measure um, the difference in the residual currents at each of these steps and you can see that the two, the two different ones here that are out of phase by one base, or the differences in their currents are all also out of phase by one base. So we're, we're definitely detecting these um, abasic um, residues. So this is like where oxid nanopore was um, I don't know, 15 years ago. Or, so, um, but it does, it does give you the idea that this kind of technology might be usable. So what would we like to do? Well, first of all, we need a longer track. And there are some proteins. Um, one of them is anthrax protective antigen yeah, or um, alomethacin. There are other proteins that have quite long potential tracks, but they're not that long. I think you could get about 18 steps um, from this molecule. So, as a challenge to the audience, what we'd really like to do is be able to do this on a surface and look at many, many hundreds of DNAs simultaneously. And if we're to do that, we need someone to pull the DNA along, we need some sort of detection device for the bases, and then we need some poor guy at the end to um, produce some drag so that the, um, the molecule is stretched out on the surface. And then if we could do hundreds or thousands of these simultaneously, it might be a practical way to, to sequence DNA or RNA. So the question is how you do that. Um, one possibility is to use, say, gold surfaces, but it's actually quite hard to get extended flat surfaces on gold. I'm sure many of you know more about this than me, so any suggestions would be welcome. And... Um, Another possibility that we're thinking of is to get the DNA to move along the surface of crystals like cadmium sulfide or cadmium um, selenide. But um, I throw that as, as a challenge to the audience that if we get a, a, a surface that we could use this uh, chemical stepping on. All right, so I'll just end up by thanking the people in my group and, whoops, in particular, um, Yuja and also Sandra, who's in the audience, who's going to give a talk uh, later today, did some of the work um, on the molecular hopper. So thanks very much. Um, thank you, Professor Bailey, for excellent talk. So questions for... Hi, thank you. Very nice. Uh, uh, just to figure, uh, to, just to see if I uh, understood, uh, your track in the motor, in the walker, the track doesn't change, it doesn't burn. It doesn't change. Burn. The, the track doesn't change, correct? You um, know, in, in irreversibly. Any, in any particular experiment, it doesn't change. But, you know but what's called burn bridge effect in no, motors? No, no, no. Okay. So that's why we can move it up and down, sure, up sure. and down, up and down. And, yeah. and so directionality only, you got directionality only because, or thanks to the currency. Uh, they, they, sorry, not currency, current. Yeah, for, from applying a potential. So the, the yeah. DNA is negatively charged. If, if we apply a positive potential, it moves downwards. Yeah. On, and okay. if we apply a negative potential, it, it moves upwards. Okay. Um, exactly why it does that is probably, like many of these things, is not quite as simple as it looks. So obviously you're moving charge in a field. That's good. Um, but um, I think there are also effects of confinement of the polymer within the pore that are imp important as well. And also, if you need to um, apply a voltage. Once it gets to the end of the track, you need to apply a voltage to flip it. And that's, that's it's also... It's actually good. flipping or just reversing the direction? It's flipping, yeah. Without, without losing into the solution? 
It's covalently attack, uh, uh, attached, but through a disulfide bond. Okay, and it, uh, it has to flip for it to do that. Um, again, it's not really obvious how it flips because two strands of DNA shouldn't fit within the barrel. Um, so the barrel is probably transiently expanding while it flips. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So, so just carrying on a little bit from that, it's, it's really nice because you can sort of watch it, but what sets the time for each step, say, when you're looking at this track? Because um, you know, you're just applying a voltage, you know, potential to try and drag it in one direction, and, and you can see the steps, and the steps are quite sharp. So if you look at the time between each step, how regular is it? Is it how stochastic is it? Well, it, it's an exponential distribution, as okay. you'd probably expect. And, and I think it's... Um, it's mainly chemical. I, I think you, you're aligning these molecules up in the sort of perfect orientation to get a linear transition state, but I don't think there's any effect of the field itself on the, on the chemistry. So it's just thermally so, diffusing around and so it's, um, eventually gets to alignment. Well, it's, it, it's pretty confined, this polymer within this tube. I'm not convinced it will actually work on a surface as I said at the end you know it may sort of float up from from the surface so you may have to do something else to to confine it to two dimensions and um, it it's also um, well I think it's sort of uh, just luck in a way that the distances are, are really correct to get this um, linear transition state here yeah. and do you see any effects on the chemistry of the confinement like when you're doing your inversion I mean, is it, is it different or the barrel is still big enough that you can do that inversion? Yeah, I mean, we, we've argued through... We've done lots of other chemistry too, and, and we, we've argued that we're, we're just about in the regime where we're sort of looking at bulk solution. So we've studied sort of innumerable chemical reactions in the barrel, and their rates are within a factor of 10 of what you see in bulk solution. I think any narrower... You know, obviously there'd be complications, and any wider, the polymer wouldn't be confined in the way we want it to within the pore. So, so this kind of two nanometer barrel is just perfect for this kind of thing. Time for one more quick question over here. Uh, uh, how, how strong does the motor stand on its feet? So you pull with another pore, I guess, quite strongly on it. Did you rip it? Not, not really. I, I reckon you, you, you're getting up to, say, 10 picanewtons, so it's not sort of bond-breaking, not even close to bond-breaking forces. And also a suggestion to your uh, flat challenge. Did you consider maybe just using flow to, to have the yeah. directionality? Yeah. No, I think... So, so basically we want a very flat surface that's quite extended. I mean, I think we're talking microns. And um, certainly, I, I think flow could help, as, as, as you know. And that could help it sort of from detaching from the surface. So we're thinking about these things, but I don't think we've come up with the you know, perfect surface to use, to use for this, yeah.